students today at the Woodridge Public Library. We have a very unusual program, I would say. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for us and excellent speakers coming to talk to you. Uh, Lindsay Olson is the uh, featured artist in our art gallery exhibit in the lobby. So as you came uh, across the lobby today, you may have seen the large textile pieces hanging. And that's actually the inspiration for today's program. Lindsay is not just an artist, but she's an artist who embeds herself with scientists and with engineers. And what she sees them doing and the processes they're working on inspires her art, including the Manufactured River exhibit, which is what we have on display. So in talking with Lindsay, who, by the way, is nationally known and shows at much bigger places than the Woodridge Public Library, so we do appreciate her show, uh, she said that her dream program is if she could pull together an engineer, and that's who we have here, Dick, and a scientist, and that's who we have, Tony, and they could talk about all these aspects, and she could connect you with the science behind her art. So thank you for coming today. You're very brave, because I don't know if that was clear, what today was all about. Uh, but these are very dynamic speakers, and I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, and she's going to do the formal introduction. So thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Patty, and I want to say we're delighted, all three of us, to be here in your brand new space. And this space looked dramatically different last month. If any of you happened to stop by and see what it looked like. I was a little nervous, but Patty said, no, no, don't worry. Everything will come off, and indeed, it's really, really beautiful. So thank you for coming to see us and to uh, see the artwork and hear, um, hear us speak about the project. Um, it's been a really interesting adventure, and you're going to hear from three different perspectives. So we'll start off the program with Dick Lanyon, and I'll introduce him by telling you that he is, um, he's had nearly 50 years of experience in, as a wastewater professional, and he capped his career as the executive director of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and although he's retired, he's still very, very active in the field. He's received numerous awards for his work as a water professional, and Dick made me promise not to read all of the awards, because we'd be here all afternoon, actually. Um, but I'll just read you two of them. He's been given the American Society of Civil Engineers National Government Civil Engineer Year of the uh, Year of uh, Engineer of the Year Award in 1999. He's also the distinguished alumni of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign 2003. So um, Dick is a very highly respected professional in his field, and when people speak of him, they speak with him speak of him with great respect and affection. So please welcome Dick Lane. Oh, shucks, Lindsay, that was very kind of you to say that. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's true. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we're going to talk about a manufactured river. How do you manufacture a river? Well, we're to, we'll tell you about that. And of course, this is a view of the downtown area of Chicago. Um, and part of the manufactured river is right, right here, or uh, the uh, south branch of the Chicago River. I'm going to show you a slide in a little ways about the south branch 100 years ago, and it's just about in this same spot. So it's kind of interesting. Well, let's proceed. Well, we want to uh, take a global perspective here, and uh, maybe I'll stand over here so that. Uh, before the slides too. Uh, in the North American continent, we have a continental divide. Of course, that's the Rocky Mountains here on the on the uh, left. But we also have several subcontinental divides. One right here in the Chicago area, and that separates the uh, the flow from the Mississippi River Basin, from the uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Basin, which uh, all the water ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. Therefore, it's a subcontinental divide. So we'll zero in on that a little bit. There's the Great Lakes uh, and the uh, Illinois River. And right here in Chicago, there's this little patch of land about 673 square miles. It was part of the Lake Michigan watershed, but um, because of the canal system in Chicago, it's now part of the Illinois and Mississippi River watershed. And then getting real close, 
Well, this is the way the drainage was in early Chicago uh, in the 1800s. That subcontinental divide uh, went right down pretty much along what we know today as Harlem Avenue. And uh, the uh, point of the portage, Chicago portage that Marquette and Joliet discovered uh, 300 years ago uh, led right off the Desplaines River in, 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 into the uh, West Fork of the South Branch. And that's how they uh, made the transition. Of course, they had the vision for connecting these two watersheds. It took several hundred years to be accomplished. But one thing about this map is that the Splains River, uh, at this point in the western suburbs, is about 20 feet higher than Lake Michigan. And uh, so when the Splains River would go into flood, because the land topography was so flat, part of the flood water would go over the divide and down the West Fork South Branch in, through the Chicago River into Lake Michigan. And big floods caused a lot of damage in the city in the early years. However, the uh, Displains River makes a very steep decline so that when you get down to Joliet, it's 40 feet below Lake Michigan. So now people say, how can you turn a river around? Well, you just take advantage of the landform here and reach the divide and get far enough and gravity will do the work. So here's that other picture of the South Branch. It's a railroad bridge. Back in the 1800s, all the bridges in the downtown area, both the road and the railroad bridges, were center pier swing bridges. They had a big pier out in the center of the water. So the channel was very narrow, flow was very restricted. And uh, you can see here a lot of scum and filth. The river was terribly polluted. Of course, all the sewers were discharging there. And it was very odiferous, very unpleasant to walk around particularly the railroad bridges, because uh, the railroads didn't like to open the bridges for boats and delay the trains. So there was a lot of uh, hostility between the land traffic and the rail traffic and the boat traffic. Well, the uh, rivers were reversed by construction of a canal, and first was the uh, sanitary and ship, oops, the sanitary and ship canal, that breached the divide here in the uh, southwest of the city. That's the Sanitary Ship Canal. And then uh, about 20 years later, they built the Calumet Sag Channel that breached the divide in the south suburbs. So we took advantage of gravity and uh, uh, were able to divert the waters into the Desplaines River. And then also, because there was such a huge difference in water level, built a hydroelectric powerhouse to capture energy. Uh, and I had to write a book about the building of that canal in the 1890s, and there's some copies on the back if you want to thumb through it. Kind of an interesting <coughs> book. And uh, how did they do it? Well, it was a lot of brute force. 15 miles of that canal went through solid rock, and they limestone, you see here, they had to blast out a, a, uh, a water course that was 160 feet wide and 30 feet deep. And they did that with dynamite. You can see them drilling and blasting and uh, manual labor to load that broken rock and uh, various devices to haul it up and put it on spoil piles. And at one time, all that rock was just piled up along the canal because they didn't know where else to haul it. Where would you haul all that rock? So they just bought enough land to spoil it next to the canal. And here you see, here you see them uh, working again on the uh, rock. Uh, excavation. Now the uh, earthing excavation, the other 13 miles of that 28 mile canal were dug by steam shovels and these were the early steam shovels of the day. Uh, these were the precursors to the uh, Panama Canal construction 20 years later. And you'll notice in this photo everything is on rails because we didn't have rubber tires or diesel engines in the 1890s and uh, it was all steam power maybe some compressed air for animals. And here's a uh, little locomotive would push these dump cars over to a spoil pile. So it was a lot of brute force that uh, built that canal and it took seven and a half years, uh, which was a long time in those days because the city was really 
anxious to get that river turned around and, and stop polluting the lake. Uh, so here's the photograph uh, right after the turn of the century when they were letting water into this 28 mile long excavation at a very controlled rate so you didn't have any erosion or uh, failures. And it took 12 days to fill that up and they had to wait for the governor to approve. He did approve. And then they lowered the, the dam at Lockport, and uh, from that date on, uh, January 17th, the Chicago River was permanently, permanently reversed. So uh, this is the first element of the manufactured river. And today, it's still there, working. It uh, starts at about Damon Avenue and goes all the way down to Lockport. But since then, other elements have been added, the Calumet Sag Channel that I mentioned earlier, and the North Shore Channel was built, and a lot of the other river segments that were already there were straightened, deepened, widened, to give them adequate capacity to move water. Now this, today we have the 77 mile network of canals, and that's the manufactured river that Lindsay has done her art around. Um, uh, three intakes on the lakefront, one at Wilmette, one downtown, and uh, the third uh, is out on the south end. This uh, lock was built uh, in the 1960s by the Corps of Engineers. This lock downtown was built in 1939 by the sanitary district. And uh, this pumping station up in Wilmette was built in 1910. So you can see there was a long period of time in order to develop this, this uh, manufactured river. And uh, down at the other end, there's only one outlet for this system. Uh, there's the powerhouse that was built right after the turn of the century. And then a small lock at first, but now then the Corps of Engineers built a bigger lock in the 1930s. So this is also part of the federal navig navigable inland waterway system. And uh, besides serving the purpose of drainage and uh, carrying away the treated wastewater from the city, it serves for navigation, and also now, today, it's become quite popular for recreation. And in order to, uh, a lot of the water in the system, over 70% of the water in the canal system comes from people that live in the city, use water, and, and have wastewater, and uh, goes through the treatment plant process. Uh, there are three huge treatment plants in the, in the city that discharge to the canal system. And this is the biggest, the Stickney Water Reclamation Plant. It's about a mile in east-west direction. Uh, it starts way over here by Laramie Avenue, and this is about Lombard Avenue here. And uh, Tony is going to talk about the process, but what you're... What you see right here is the secondary process, aeration basins, and settling tanks. Uh, and then there's a pump house over here and, and another pump house back here. There is a graphical dis uh, depiction of this. It's a handout. You can carry it away. I see some folks have it already. One side is the map. You just saw the waterways. And the other side is a schematic of the treatment process. Treatment process is pretty simple. Uh, it's three, uh, three processes are used. Physical separation, either uh, by screening uh, and filtration, where you separate solids from liquids. Also gravity separation, where heavier sol solids settle to the bottom of a tank and lighter oils and greases, uh, fats from kitchens and so forth will float to the surface and are skimmed off. And third is the biological digestion which consists of aeration to supply a lot of air and flocculation. More detail on that in a little while. But this simulates the natural uh, purification process you find in a river, but it does it in a very expedited fashion. Uh, and where do these uh, biological organisms come from? They come from all of us, because as we're sitting here today, we're generating the organisms that are going to be used in the treatment process to digest the, the waste materials. There was no chemicals used in the process, except um, for some processes for disinfection, chlorine compounds are used, and uh, 
also some uh, in the filtration process some of the chemicals are used to enhance filtration. Mechanical equipment, a lot of pumps in order to use to lift the water out of the deep sewers and, and to move the liquids around the treatment plant and of course blowers to supply the air. Uh, this is a rake from a screen. This some photographs they took at the at the O'Brien plant up on our side at Skokie. The screen is down about 40 feet. Very hard to get down there to see it. But this is the rake, and this comes up. If there were debris on the screen, it would be on this rake, and it's come up and put into a dumpster. So that's one of the physical separation processes. And then these are the pumps that lift the sewage from deep underground to the treatment process. And these are the blowers that supply the air to the aeration tanks. This is a settling tank called a preliminary tank, um, where most of the, the inorganic solids settle out and some of the floating material is skimmed off the surface. And then these are the aeration basins, typically long, narrow tanks where the air is introduced at the bottom, making a roll rotating mixing process. And then final settling tanks, again, very quiet and settling because there's a flock produced in the aeration tanks that needs quiet water to settle out. And uh, the effluent from that goes into the canal system. So here is the uh, benefits of the waterways that become quite popular for recreation. And I say thank you because this is almost my last slide. But I wanted to show you another slide. We're out here in DuPage <coughs> County, um, far from the treatment plants I was just talking about. But uh, so we're right down here in Woodridge, and the sewage here is handled at the, the Green Valley Woodridge Treatment Plant, operated by the Du County, uh, DuPage County Public Works Department. But in DuPage County, things are a little different than in Cook County. In Cook County, we have one regional district. We only have seven treatment plants for four and a half million people, uh, five million people. So two of our plants are up here in the headwaters of Salt Creek, the uh, Egan plant uh, near Sch the Schaumburg Woodfields shopping mall, and then the smaller plant over here in Hanover Park on the west branch of the Page. And then in Salt Creek, you have a number of plants along Salt Creek, and then the East Fork of the DuPage, a number of plants along the West Branch of the DuPage River. So, but all these plants basically use the same process that I described. Thank you very much. Um, as Patty mentioned, I make art about science, and I do it for entirely selfish reasons, because I really want to know what's going on. I want to learn about <clears throat> how things work. And before this project began, um, I would blithely flip on a wall switch and open my computer um, or use my cell phone, and um, all without an appreciation and understanding of the ways in which science and engineering support our culture. So maybe some of you have come here to the talk today to hear about these things um, because you're curious about how water is managed in your communities. And I just want to tell, I know that some of you in this room may be like me, a formerly science book person. Um, but I just wanted to tell you that science is a lot of fun, and it's not as scary as it seems. <laughs> so for many years, um, I painted all things watery, and I made impressionistic work, uh, works along the banks of the Midwest's many waterways, and this is what my work environment looked like. And when I started this project, Manufactured River, and I told people where I was working, Everybody wanted to know why. Why would I trade a working environment that looked like this for a working environment that looked like this? And you can see my drawing board in the lower right hand corner. This is in the sticky pump house that Dick was talking about. Um, so I've always had a strong attachment to water. And early in my career, as I said, I painted these oil paintings along the waterways, making something called the Waterway Project. This is what my work used to look like. Mainly what I was doing was uh, creating idealized portraits of the waterway. So I would edit out things like buildings, power lines, parking lots, and trying to harken back to an earlier waterway. Um, and a 
around this time, my husband and I bought a canoe. So we, we'd been canoeing over most of the navigable waterways in Chicago, and we were on the Cal State Channel. We just happened to pass this structure, and this is called a SEPA station, and it's a side stream elevated aeration station. And this structure really nagged at me because I thought, geez, that's like the weirdest water fountain I'd ever seen. <laughs> it's also in such an incredibly obscure location that nobody would really be able to enjoy it very much. And the structure nagged at me. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I wanted to find out who built that and why. And that's what sent me on this huge technical and scientific and creative in, um, endeavor. Um, a defining moment in my art practice came when I decided to invent an artist residency with our local police department. Um, I learned so many things working with the police department over several years. I put up an art gallery inside the um, uh, station house just for them. We'd rotate a lot of different artists' work through every month. I think we did like 22 shows. And in the process of doing that, I realized two things. One, um, that for me as an artist, it was really meaningful to pair something that I cared about, an issue that I cared about with my creative skills. Um, working with the police also gave me access to a completely different visual vocabulary. So those two things were really quite important in my development as an artist. So I don't want to talk too much about that project. It's a whole separate story, and maybe I'll be here in another few years and bother Patty about showing my police project. Um, but getting back to wastewater treatment, um, when I work on a residency, I plan for a full immersion experience. I attend seminars and lectures. I talk to a lot of scientists, operators, and engineers. I do a lot of reading. Because really when I do my projects, I don't want to just portray the surface details of wastewater treatment. I really wanted to understand the science behind it and express the spirit of the industry. So I've already given you some of Dick's credentials. He's like a legend in the wastewater treatment field. And I was so lucky that on, I think, the first month of the project, I went to a, uh, a seminar at the Stickney plant, and I met Dick. And within five minutes of telling him about my project, he goes, yes, I'll help you. And I thought, I went home and I thought, oh, well, okay, that's nice, but I didn't know what that meant. Well, Dick introduced me to a lot of people in the industry. He helped me show work at conferences. But the most important thing about the educational aspect was that Dick is a really good educator, um, as you can judge from his talk to you. And he explained really complicated engineering terms to me in ways that I understood. And it was, it was really a wonderful gift. So I like to think of Dick as, um, Dick, you're kind of like my fairy godbrother. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, it took 18 months to get permission to work in the Stickney facility, because first of all, this was like the weirdest thing anybody had ever heard of in this area. There were like no artists competing for this, which was great <laughs> in a way and bad in another way. Another disadvantage was it took me so long to uh, get the permission uh, I needed for the project because Dick retired one month before I applied. <laughs> So I had to wait for the new director, and you know, the new director be, my, was not quite as, um, he was receptive, but perhaps not as enthusiastic, we would say. Um, so then I later found out, you know, I had to pitch an idea to um, administrators, operators, and all sorts of people. And I later found out that the only reason I was given permission to go in there, because Homeland Security keeps a big close watch on these plants, is because I had done the project with the police department. I guess they figured I was pretty, um, I, I was pretty trustworthy if they were letting me run around in their department. Mm -hmm. So combining art and wastewater treatment was a real visual and intellectual challenge. It can be really intimidating to walk into this kind of industrial complex. And I'd never really worked in an area where I needed a hard hat or ear protection or anything like that. And it did feel like I was walking into a strange land. And I had to learn the language of science to understand what was going on. So one of the first people I met in the plant was Tony chief microbiologist. And Tony was so passionate about her work that she inspired me to start my project with the activated sludge process, which Dick touched on a little bit. So Tony's going to tell you more about that in detail. But this whole process in this aeration tank here is really mimicking what nature does. So scientists and engineers have put together this system based on how our clean water is cleaned naturally. It's just that there's so many of us and there's so many uh, microbes needed, there's certain, like, certain conditions needed to treat the water that we have to like 
artificially add extra oxygen and control the flow of the food, which is our waste, to the microbes in order to have the system balance out. <coughs> so um, a really powerful lesson for me at this point in the project was that if I used my training as an artist, I could learn science. And it sounds funny for me to say this to you, but I actually fell in love with science in the middle of this very wastewater treatment plant right here. So after finishing a couple of those pieces um, about the microbes, I thought to myself, gee, you know, I have all this artistic enthusiasm, but is it scientifically accurate? Did I get the science right? So I packed up all my artwork. You remember this day really well, I'm sure. I packed up all my artwork and carted it down to the sticking plant, and I set up all the work around the room. And I left off all the labels, because when the microbiologist walked in the room, I wanted to know, did I get it? Did I get it right? So I'm waiting there, feeling really nervous, and they walk in, and they were like, oh my god, that's filamentous bacteria, it's such and such, and oh, that's a, a, a crawling cell. And I was so relieved. They were so enthusiastic about the project that it really inspired me to continue on with my work. So I thought I would show you a couple of examples of my interpretation of some of the filamentous bacteria and the way scientists see it. So operators, operators are trained, they spend a lot of time training to identify species of bacteria and other microbes because by counting them and by examining them, um, they can tell how, how efficiently the plant is working and if something needs to be tweaked and adjusted to make it work better. So this is one of the crawling ciliates. I love Aspidisca. I don't know what it is, but I just, they're listed like one of my favorites. And this is Vorticella, which is another cilia. Um, and this may look very pretty, like a flower in your garden or something, but this is actually a very ruthless competitor for food and oxygen in the tank. Not quite as sweet as it looks. And then this is an amoeba eating a paramecium. So all the while I was learning about the treatment process, I was filtering that information through my skill as an artist. I wanted to make up art that would shake up people's complacency and help communities understand that water professionals are public health and environmental heroes. So a lot of artists use oil paint, watercolor, other traditional media. But when I work, I want to use material that really supports the subject and the meaning of the subject. And I also want to figure out a way that reduces the distance between the viewer and the artwork. So water is an intimate substance. We drink in it, we bathe in it, we use it sacramentally. And in addition to that, all of us use textiles every day. So it felt like a natural way to connect with viewers. The color choice is important too. Um, the colors that I ultimately chose lean towards red, yellow, and blue, which are the primary colors because water is primary to life. And um, in a wastewater treatment, there's a lot of different people who work there. There's scientists, there's engineers, operators, and tradespeople. And I wanted to use textiles that would reflect that diversity. So I used silk and denim, linen, cotton, all of those things, mounted on a workmanlike canvas. So I wanted the choice of the textiles to reflect the diversity in the workplace. I also experimented with a lot of hand processes, things that take a great deal of time, like beading and embroidery, and all of those sorts of processes are used traditionally in garments for royalty or the wealthy. And it's just one more way for me to show that the subject of treated wastewater is an elevated subject, worthy of our attention. So I thought I'd show you a couple of pages from my sketchbook, because people seem to enjoy them. Um, this is where I mess around with my materials and where I was learning about what a food vacuole was and what a cell septa was and what shape the cell septa was and how the, these microbes, you know, move around and all that. These are just two of my pages from the sketchbook. So after learning about the microbial process, I moved on to the pump house. And um, it really does require a lot of thoughtful engineering to put uh, together a plant like this. Um, but when I arrived at the Stickney Pump House, it's like seven stories tall, it's an enormous building, it's filled with gi six giant pumps that make a lot of noise, and I thought, oh my god, this is such a visually confusing place, how <coughs> will I ever make sense of what's happening here? So eventually, working in that building and drawing and talking to people and doing a lot of reading and asking Dick a lot of questions, um, I, I kind of made a connection 
between the hydrology of the water waste project and the hydrology in the plant, because water obeys the laws of physics. It's indiscriminate about the contents of the water. So that was a huge moment for me to understand that those two systems are intimately connected. Eventually, I met a really nice engineer at one of those seminars who said, you know, all those pipes in that building, they all mean something. They're all color-coded for a purpose. The yellow is for effluent, the silver is for air, the blue is for city water, and the brown is for sludge. So I thought, wow, as an artist, that's a good jumping off point. So I incorporated those colors into the first sets of pieces about the Palm House. So in these pieces, I'm stirring up trouble, visual trouble. I'm trying to upend people's assumptions about wastewater treatment. I'm evoking waves and waves of water um, through using a kind of uh, technique of making ruffles that's used in fashion design. So the yellow is the color of the effluent containing pipe. And I also actually sourced this textile, which is one that's really used in the plant to pop up spills. So it, it's, it is really an industrial textile, the ones that's forming, the uh, textiles that are used to form those waves. Um, so what I wanted to do was I wanted to link the myth of Poseidon, protector of water, with the people whose job it is to clean our wastewater, and thereby elevating the job as well. So I wanted to disrupt a cultural perception, really, that wastewater is something to flush and forget. These are pieces I created about biosolids. Now, after the water is treated, the clean water is siphoned off the top of the tank, and then what's left is the solid form of the waste. And after about 18 months, it's really like black gold. Biosolids used to be carted off to the landfill. Now communities are understanding that biosolids can help them remediate the soils that have been damaged through excessive farming or development. Also, some really forward-thinking officials at the district are um, extracting important chemicals like phosphorus from biosolids so that they can be recycled and reused back into farming. The way that we do our farming in the United States is a very high intensity of um, farming and requires a lot of chemicals, and phosphorus is one of those chemicals we are going to run short of in about 20 years. So this is a really important process. So having my artwork here and coming to speak to you, all of us coming to speak to you, um, I use this project to help communities understand about the process of wastewater treatment and how it may be a process that most people think of as unpleasant, but it's a highly life-affirming process and a very necessary process. And actually, one of the interesting things I learned was that um, solving this issue of treating our wastewater and finding clean drinking water has been the most successful public health initiative in human history. Without it, many of us might not even be here today. Really, more than cancer treatment, more than antibiotics, having clean water and dealing with our, our waste has been an incredible boon to health. It's probably why we live so long now. So um, water, more than any other resource, will define the quality of our lives in the coming years. And we only have to look at the drought conditions out west to know that water is a precious resource. I also want you to know that getting in over your head intellectually can be a very exciting adventure. <laughs> and Tony is here to show you that you and I do not need a PhD in science to learn about it. So thank you. Tony is the senior microbiologist at the Stevie Plant. Um, she's worked in the field for over 35 years. She's the author of two books on microbiology of the wastewater treatment plant, which I devoured, dog-eared to death. Um, and she also is very famous. She travels extensively to the United States to help other treatment plants solve problems that are very mystifying, and she sorts them all out. So thank you, and please welcome Tony. Okay, originally, I went to medical school. I won a full scholarship to medical school because I was gonna be a doctor. But then I hated sick people. <laughs> if you're gonna be a doctor, you should probably like being around sick people, but I, that's for special people. I have a daughter who's a doctor. She, that's my hat goes off to them. So I saw advertisement for a job at a wastewater treatment plant. So I called up my mom. I won a full scholarship to medical school. So I called my mom up. I said, Hey, mom, I'm gonna take this job at the wastewater treatment plant. And I'm gonna blow this scholarship to medical school. So she wasn't very happy about that. But I ended up not being a people doctor. But what I ended up being was a poop eating bug doctor. <laughs> And so my son said, Mom, put the comma in the right place. You can't say poop-eating, comma, bug doctor. You have to say a poop-eating bug 
comma, doctor. <laughs> so that's what I became. So I became a person that looks at these microorganisms under the microscope and to be able to diagnose how well these, treat these treatment systems are running. So let me get your... Oh, okay, so you can change. So it's more than just microorganisms. So like this, let's kind of give you a little quick um, schematic here. The wastewater kind of comes through from our homes and all of this stuff has all the microorganisms that we need. It comes in, it goes through these screens, slows down, the grit kind of settles out, comes to primary, the oils come off the top, the solids, the inner kind of solids go off and goes into solids handling. And this water here contains kind of most of the dissolved waste and it goes into this tank with all the microorganisms. Now, if you want microorganism, this would be the best job for you, okay? <laughs> this is your ideal look, uh, uh, occupation. Because what you would do is you'd swim around here all day long and eat. That's all you would do. And then you'd get really fat and full, and they put you over here, and then you just go to sleep. You settle out and go to sleep. And then when you get hungry again, we bring you back around, and you just eat some more. That's all you do. And then you come over here, and you go to sleep. Kind of remind you of your kids, don't you? And you go over here. And then when you get old, you can retire over to Silas Hand. So you get this good separation between the liquids and the solids. Okay, so these are the bugs here. Okay. Okay, so like, but we're going to focus on that aeration basin, that basin with all the microorganisms. And so if you think about it, when the wastewater first comes in, you've got lots of food for the bugs. But by the time it goes down a long aeration basin, most of the food is mostly gone because they've eaten it. The thing that eats most of the waste is bacteria. 95% of those microorganisms are, are, are bacteria. And they love your poop. They just love to eat it. Okay, so they eat it and they eat all the waste. And then once most of the waste is gone, they do a very specific thing. They get rid of their tails, they stop swimming around, they get fat, they stick together, and they settle. So we don't just want any kind of microorganism to come into this treatment system. We want the ones that once they get full and there's not a lot of food left, they get rid of their tails, they stop swimming, they get fat, and they clump together. So that's a specific, a specific type of microorganism called flock-forming bacteria. Not all bacteria form flock. So treatment systems are designed to sort of favor this particular type of microorganism. The ones that eat all day, get fat, stick together, and settle out, okay, like our kids. Okay, so in order for us to get good treatment, we have to get this separation between the liquids and the solids. So we want the kind of bugs that can settle, that can settle down here. Okay. Did I just tap on the video? No, go back. Yeah. You got to make sure that the, the mouse, the cursor's on it. Okay. So this is a bacteria. I've been doing this for like 35 years. They're boring. Okay? <laughs> They're really boring to look at. But there are other things that I can look at that can tell me what's going on in this system. So I, I just I try not to have to be stuck with looking at the microorganisms. But these are the, these are the primary ones that do the work of removing all the organic material. Okay, next. Okay, so you, then you have to go off off the video. Okay. So when I'm looking, if you look at that aeration basin, and it, at the beginning, where it's lots of food, the first one, so we're going to kind of take a timeline from that beginning when the food is high all the way down to when the food is low. So at the beginning when the food is low, you can click on it, when the food is really, really high, we have, a, if I take my sample from the end of the aeration basin, I should not see these. Because look, at, look how slow it moves. This is an amoeba. It moves very, very slow. So in order for it to survive, it has to have lots of food. If you move that fast in my house, you do not eat. Okay? <laughs> so you have to be able to move pretty fast in order to survive. So when I look at these, if I see a lot of, of amoeba, it tells me something. If I'm grabbing my sample from the end of the process and I see these, what that says to me, it's still a whole bunch of food there. So they haven't really completed their treatment process. Or it could tell me that oxygen is too low because it moves so slow it doesn't require enough oxygen. It can tell me some other things too. This particular amoeba like to eat the sort of solid particles. And so a bacteria have to have it dissolved. So if after a heavy rain when lots of solids comes in, they can kind of survive off of the solid particles. So it tells me a lot of different things. But on a normal basis, on a well operating system, I should not see these dominating in my system. If I do, it can tell me certain things. Okay, next. 
So as I, we travel down that trend line, the next thing that starts showing up on the scene are your flagellates. What these do is they, all those little tiny dots are bacteria, but they like to eat the dissolved stuff just like the bacteria, so they're competing with the bacteria. So bacteria multiply every 20 minutes. This guy takes five and a half hours. So by the time he multiplies once, bacteria, two of them can turn into 372,000 of them. And so they only can survive early in the process. But if I take a sample from the end of my process and I see these, it tells me something. It tells me there's either a lot of food there, or I like to call these the ambulance chasers. What they do is they like to take that long straw thing that's coming out of their head and stick it into the body of dead things and suck all their juices out. So they like to suck out the juices of dead things. And so if something comes into my plant that's kind of toxic and it starts killing off some of my, those microorganisms, I'll see a whole bunch of these because they'll be in there with their straw stuck into their body, sucking all the juices out of them. Okay? Amen. So as the food level starts getting a little bit low, what happens is we've got lots of bacteria now because they've eaten up most of the food and they're multiplying. So now we have to have something that can don't care that there's no food, they just care that it's bacteria. So they feed off the bacteria, that's their chocolate. And see, remember I told you, not all the bacteria settle down to the bottom. Some of them is still, there are other bacteria that's still floating in the fluid. So this guy, if you look really closely, you can see him actually drawing the, the, the bacteria inside his body. So he does a really good job of swimming around in the fluid and sucking in all that bacteria. So you, you didn't realize this would happen when you flush the toilet, didn't you? <laughs> so they literally are clear, clearing, the, clearing the water. These solid particles over here is some of the bacteria that's clumped together, but this guy is literally swimming around and clarifying that fluid. So as we travel further along that aeration basin, now you've got most of the food is gone, and what happens to that bacteria most of the food is gone? They clump together and they start forming solids. And so the guys that's swimming around, they can't, if there's no more bacteria left because it's all clumped together. So I call these the dial bath and cleaning scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> and so they just like to crawl along on solid particles and graze. And so if I grab a sample from the end of the process and I see a bunch of crawling ciliates, that's a good sign. So that means I have solids. And the reason why I have solids is because the bacteria has eaten up most of the food and they've clumped together and formed solids. So now I'm, I'm kind of happy because I make my process is working well. Okay, don't push this one yet. Okay. okay, so now it becomes the survival of the fist. Okay? Most of the food is gone because my bacteria is starting to form flocks. The free swimmers are all out in the fluid and they've gotten rid of cleaning up most of the stuff in that fluid. So now you have to have an ability to get some food when it's not a lot left. So if this young man right here could just stand in one spot and suck food into his head, and the rest of us had to go to the restaurant and get in our cars he would have the advantage because he didn't have to do anything. He'd just stand here and suck it into his head. So these guys have the ability to stand in one spot, create a vortex, and suck food into his head. So if you click on that. So he just stands there and sucks it into his head. This is my 26-year-old son, Daniel. <laughs> sits on the sofa. I'm in the kitchen, the refrigerator door flies open, and I see a chicken leg, it comes out, and I follow it, and it gets sucked right into his head. So this just goes to show there's not much left now. So as it gets older, you'll see other species that have hundreds of heads. So you can click to the next one. That's not a video. I'm sorry. Okay. So have hundreds of heads. They can have hundreds of heads. And so the more heads, the older, the longer the time in it. That means it's less and less and less stuff in the fluid. So that's a good sign when I start seeing lots of heads. That means that they have to have more heads in order to get some food. And that's my 30-year-old son, Lawrence. <laughs> when Lawrence is home, Dale doesn't eat. <laughs> when they're both home, I'm the amoeba. I do not eat. <laughs> so that's so as it gets older and older, what happens is there's nothing left now. So they start feeding off of each other, okay? So like what this one does, I like to call this one a she. So what she does is that if that poor little scrubbing bubble that goes along, she'll just take it and suck it into her tentacle, okay? And hold it there while it's still alive and kicking and screaming. And then she shoots a poison into it and it paralyzes it. 
they would, the, the, the merciful thing would be to kill it, but she doesn't. She just leaves it there alive and paralyzed, and then she sucks the juice out of it, sucks the life out of it while it's still alive. You're Stephen King, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, this one reminds me of my famous mother in law. <laughs> so, so if you look at <laughs> this, this is therapeutic. Okay, so if you look at you can actually see the suckers in there. Okay. So now it's not much left, so you start getting higher life forms. Those were protozoa. Protozoa are single cell, they split in two. Now you get metazoa. <coughs> metazoa are, are larger. They're male and female. They have more complicated systems. They take longer to, 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 to grow and to be born. So it's the system as it's in there longer, you'll start seeing these showing up in the scene. These are, this is a rotifer. And I have just a quick story to tell you about rotifers. Most of the rotifers in the system are females because they know how to take care of business and get things done. Okay. <laughs> And when she has an egg, she has two eggs. She has a male egg and a female egg. The female egg hatches, turns into, and goes out and takes care of business. But the male egg is called a degenerate. I didn't say you had to talk to God. <laughs> it's called, literally called a degenerate. And the reason why it's called a degenerate is because when it's born, it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know. It just sits there. It craps. And it just sits like a lump, and it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to feed it. It doesn't know what to do, what's the purpose in life. And it waits for a female to come along. Once he fertilizes it, he dies, and that's his whole purpose in life. <laughs> so, so this is a female. If you click on it, no, go back. And click on the... Yeah. So that's a female. She can suck into food, food into both sides of her head. She can chomp on it and chew on it. She can dislodge herself, swim around, clean up the fluid all around. Now go to the male. The degenerate. So this is the male. He's just sitting there. Where's my wife? <laughs> what should I do? So what he does, he sits there and he, he craps. He sits there and he craps. And he just waits for the female to come along. And when she does, he fertilizes her. And then he dies. That one is my ex-husband. Okay. <laughs> All right, so next. So as the process goes on, you'll see stuff like worms. Okay. See, that's my new husband right there. He's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see worms. It's just, yeah. You'll see stuff like worms. They're harmless. They settle out in the solids. But they're just indicators that it's older. It's getting older. And that's this brown stuff is the, the bacteria that's clumped together. OK, you can go to the next one. And then you'll start stuff like water bears. Water bears have four sets of legs with claws. You know, they're, they take longer to, to, to grow in the systems. They'll take their bottom four legs and wrap it around its prey, take the top four legs, open up a hole, stick its mouth in, suck all the juices out of it, and then you have the skin left. Then it'll take the skin and suck the skin up. You know, so this is a water bear. <laughs> and you see him, he's, he's sucking the skin up. He just ate all the juices out of it. It's not a video. So this is a video of a water bear. So if you see these, they're, they're, it's a, a good sign. It's, it's clean. They don't like ammonia, so that means that the system is, is, is nice and clean. So we literally count all of these different species, and we figure which one is the dominant one, and it tells us how well our system is working. So we don't always look for the good guys. Okay, you can click to the next one. We look for the bad guys. This one is an amoeba. And if we see, some species have the ability to form shells to protect themselves. So sometimes something can come into the system that's toxic, not toxic enough to kill them, but toxic enough to make them put on some protective mechanisms. And so when we start seeing a bunch of protective mechanisms, we know something toxic is coming into our plant. And so this is an amoeba that's formed a shell. He's trying to eat this little flagellate here, but he doesn't want to come out of the shell because he doesn't think it's safe. But when we start seeing a bunch of shell species, then uh, we know that something toxic is hitting our plant. Let me go to the next one. This is another one that forms a tube. So this one can form a tube. It'll come out, feed as long as it can feed until it fills up its whole body. Then it'll suck itself back into its tube. So when I see stuff like that, that tells me that something uh, harsh is coming to the plant. So it goes back in. And so the next time you flush the toilet, just realize that you're creating this world of microbes. Okay? It's a world of microbes. It's not just a simple plunger or 
or, or, or what's the guy's name on the honeymooners that does that? It's not that simple. It is really an intricate system. And we, now we have specialized microorganisms that do nothing but remove phosphorus. We have specialized microorganisms that do nothing but remove <coughs> ammonia. And so the systems have to be adjusted and, and special conditions made. So the, our operators have to actually do some intricate manipulation of these systems to make sure all of these bugs are happy. Because if the bugs are happy, they're going to call me. And they're going to say, come and see us, we're sick. And so that's my job to go and make sure they're not sick. So any questions? Yeah, let's do open questions for everybody. Oh. Yeah, I, I have one question for Richard and one question for the doctor. Um, you were mentioning the history of the, the drainage system. Isn't there a residuum of, of mud lake that's left and alongside the Stevens and not far from Spickney that is still you know, was part of the eight? Nothing there, huh? Because no. they keep saying that there's, there's still something there that you can see that was at one time mud lake. Well, <clears throat> things have been built on it and it's built, it's been filled in. And it's, so it's all gone. It's gone. It's okay. gone. And, and the question if I have you, there have been a number of studies that indicate that bacteria can communicate with one another. Now, they do that uh, by chemical means, I assume, but is that helpful to you at all, at all this process? Yes, because what they, what they do is, you, I can tell, there's other things, when we, we talked about looking for indications when something is wrong. What bacteria will do is that they will form what's called a zuglio community. And they do that by sending out chemical signals to one another. And they will pull different types of bacteria into their communities. And they won't let just anybody come into their communities. So if you, they specifically send out chemicals just to get ones to, into their communities that benefit the whole. Because they say, okay, we need to survive in this, this environment. It's not so good. And so they'll, like say for instance, the ones on the outer edge of the community have to have more oxygen than ones in the middle. But the ones in the middle can't get access to the food. So they'll eat the crap of the ones on the outer edge. And if they don't like to eat your crap, they won't let you come and live in their community. Mm -hmm. So they literally do send out chemical signals out to different microorganisms and pull them into their communities. And that's how a lot of the um, biofilms in the pipes and stuff are formed too. They're actually sending out chemical uh, signals. It's called quorum sensing. And they send out these chemical signals and invite other microorganisms. Overall, it improves the efficiency of the whole system? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is uh, for Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, the process you use to do this counting, uh, is that, I mean, I'm sure you're not, you know, taking samples with a microscope manually, or maybe you are, or are you, do you have some kind of a video pro and, and image uh, recognition processing system? No, actually we are taking samples and we're looking at it under the microscope and we are counting them manually. Uh, we're counting them manually and then if we, I see something interesting I can videotape it or whatever. But yeah, we literally have a, a process of counting them manually. There's actually some research being done at IIT right now with a group of researchers who are trying to find genetic markers so that um, operators don't have to be so concerned with the look of the microbe, they can do use genetic marking. But yeah, they're, yeah they're, we, we, we have a, 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 a molecular lab also, and we're looking at uh, some uh, genetic, because you can specifically identify the species. The problem with a lot of the qPCR or the, or the polymerase chain reaction is that it, it tests for DNA, and so you get both live and dead microorganisms. So that's the kind of the issue with that. So we don't know what's actually viable because you, you, DNA, it doesn't matter. If it was there and it's dead, it doesn't matter. So you don't know what's actually living. So we, we're still kind of wrestling with how to take those molecular methods and make it practical for uh, operations. Yes, sir? Is there a way that um, sick people who are, have a bacterial strain uh, can be treated based on some of the research you guys do? In other words, boy, th this patient's got this bacterial thing going on, and uh, maybe we can talk to this doctor who knows how to, how to I don't know, um, attack that bacteria. Or, is there a relationship between you guys and the physicians? Uh, and not necessarily with us in the physician, but what we know and what clinical microbiologists know. So they're aware of the same 
functionality. Bacteria act the same in wastewater as they do a lot of times in the body. A lot of the diseases are caused by some of the same reasons especially like cholera or something, where bacteria will lodge itself into your lung and it'll just sit there until and start calling out other ones until it gets big enough to actually cause an infection. So some of these same processes, and, they, and the clinical world, the medical world does have an understanding of that process. And so they're kind of using that understanding of the process to help deal with and some of these One illnesses. more question. Uh, there are certain microbes that take out just phosphorus, you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got, can you guys mutate uh, to... to uh, a microbe so that it, I wanted to take out this chemical or you guys go through mutation or just... no we don't we don't genetically change anything we okay. just know that there's some some microorganisms that have the ability to just really do a luxury uptake of phosphorus and then we know there's certain microorganisms that we move ammonia that nitrify take out um, take out ammonia thank you Kristen? I, you know like you probably don't do it but sort of I'm following up on this question I mean some uh, some chemists are developing microbes that will, for example, eat oil. So if there's an oil spill, they'll put that out there and they'll try to gobble up the oil. So they do mutations and things like right. that. Right. They do, do not, genetically not, engineered. Not the sanitary district. Yeah, we don't do it, but they do have genetically engineered microorganisms, yeah. and they genetically engineer them to, for, to, for a specific reason. So they can be genetically engineered to do one thing better than the other. You have organisms that are genetically engineered to help remove fats. So you can get them because you've got a treatment system that have a whole lot of fat coming in. You can get bugs that are specifically genetically engineered to remove fat or genetically engineered to remove proteins or stuff like that. So they do that. Do that. This is an idea for a science fiction film. <laughs> <laughs> this is a science fiction film. Yeah. Yeah. Just people. <laughs> or, or the science. <laughs> <laughs> a question for Dick, I think. Um, when, when we drive into Stevenson, going downtown, and we see what our sludge pits around Hodgkins, how does that fit into this whole system? The, um, along the uh, Stevenson there in Hodgkins is a series of what are called drying cells. Sludge pits is a term we don't use anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I use. Uh, I'll, I'll do at one time, they were just sludge pits where th sludge was dumped and left. But now, uh, the biosolids process, it's spread out on these drying cells and allowed to dry in the atmosphere. And after two or three years, it's, uh, it's periodically uh, turned over with uh, mechanical equipment. And after two or three years, uh, you know, it's become pathogen free and it's um, used as uh, soil amendments on parks and open land and also uh, called out to farmland and used as a supplement for fertilizer. Next so that's what those are. And, and then there's one uh, other thing along Stevenson, uh, that's the McCook Reservoir. That's part of the tarp deep tunnel system. But you can't see that from the expressway because it's behind landscaping and fencing. I just kind of wanted to add that a lot of people think that when we when they land spread the, the biosolids, that they're land spreading poop. Well, you're literally not land spreading poop, you're land spreading the big fat bugs that settle to the bottom that ate your poop. <laughs> yeah, they've been digesting. <laughs> they've been digesting. It's in their bellies. Yeah, they've gone through anaerobic digestion yeah. and then uh, yeah. uh, using centrifuges to extract the water, reduce the water content, and then uh, Air dried, as I indicated, or we also have heat drying at the Stickney plant to create a pelletized product. And our, our labs test the test the biosolids before it can be land spread. So we test it for viruses, parasites, bacteria, and so it, it comes to our labs. And if, if it's there, we let they wait on our results before they allow it to go out to be land spread. Yeah, kind of a follow-up, if you have problems with any like heavy metals or corrosive things going into the water system? The, uh, the, the metals are uh, eliminated uh, prior to the sewage coming to the plant through a, what I call a pretreatment enforcement program. Uh, industries are classified and you have to have a permit to discharge an industrial waste and you have to have on uh, implant treatment systems to remove 
toxic metals, cyanide, other chemicals that would be toxic to the bugs in the treatment process. So that's a very uh, important enforcement program that's administered by the district. I think you told me once, Dick, that it's much, much easier to remove heavy metals in single, if it's one heavy metal at the site where it's generated. Right. But if all of the heavy metals come to the plant together, it's nearly impossible to get them out. Yeah. So through a series of enforcement, it makes it much easier to keep the, everything cleaner. Hey, can I have a question right there? Yes? Yeah, I remember 30 years, 40 years ago, whatever, um, the Department of Health we were um, told the, the, the sludge or whatever, you know, the, the soil was okay now. They have, you know, taken everything out and you could go and get the soil or they would even truck soil to your gardens and that. And then they said, oh, wait a minute, no, uh, these are not, these soils are no good anymore because that will, they were giving to us because of these metals and things. But I assume since then they found a way to Clarify all that? Yes, you have a good memory. Yeah. Well, back in the 1970s, the district had a program called New Earth, yeah. NU uh, hyphen Earth. Yeah. And uh, it was the brainchild of Commissioner Joanne Alter. And um, it was a very popular program. But uh, then uh, it came out that there's metals in this in this material and you shouldn't put it on your home garden. So that program was cut back immediately and uh, since then, uh, the enforcement of industrial waste was uh, increased to remove the metals before they get to the plant. And now there's a whole host of federal regulations around biosolids and sludge, as we call it. And uh, so it's a much different product today than it was back in the 70s. I think Milwaukee sells theirs. Yeah. Well, Milwaukee has a heat drying process and it's sold retail. It's called Malorganite. Um, we, we have the, a similar heat drying process. It's sold uh, commercially, not in the hardware store or garden shop, but it's sold to farmers. So, yeah. Do you ever look at the anaerobic microorganisms, and, and if so, how are they different? Can you, can you describe that? Yeah, they are like more boring. But <laughs> <laughs> more boring. Because they're because they're because they're bacteria, and so okay. they're. Um, uh, protozoa are aerobic, so they have to have air, so they, you don't see them in there. So they're, they're just a lot more uh, boring. And so you just look at them under the microscope, or you can do other tests to see if they produce gas or to see if right. they're aerobic. So yeah, it's a lot more boring. I don't think they're boring. I'm going to disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> visually boring. Visually boring. But they actually oh, so work community. Yeah. Um, anaerobic bacteria, unlike the aerobic bacteria, are hugely competitive. Um, but the anaerobic bacteria work communally together and actually one species will sacrifice itself because dead, its nutrients um, allow another species to become ascendant. So there's this whole... It's a sacrificial it's a, thing. It's a set, right. Yeah. right. So it, 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 they are fascinating, but in a different way. Yeah, they are. But if, if you just got to sit on them, sit down and look at them on the microscope all day long, you'll go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you got a question? Yes. Um, we're hearing in the news now about the Flint oh, water system. Troubles. And the way I understand it, and I don't think I understand it well, but the problem is that the water that was brought in from the river source uh, wasn't treated with a certain chemical that would suppress the leaching of um, dangerous metals from the uh, pipes that it was running in, if, if that's, if I'm putting that correctly. And I wondered, you know, I assume our water sources use the same kind of chemicals. And it, is that right? And how are, do they affect the um, uh, water treatment system, the presence of these chemicals in any way? Well, uh, our water, as you say, in the Chicago area, it all comes from Lake Michigan. And it's um, a very high quality source of water. And the folks out here, it comes through the city of Chicago treatment system. Um, and. Uh, Yes, it's, uh, you know, we have safe uh, drinking water regulations administered, administered by the federal government and you have every water producer and distributor at the municipalities have to test the water and inform the citizens of its quality. So you'll, each year your local utility will produce what is 
a clean water report. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the treatment of water is pretty um, standardized. It's use the filtration and, and flocculation to settle out the solids and, and then it's disinfected to uh, inactivate the bacteria, make it safe. And, uh, polymers are added to uh, re inhibit any corrosion of uh, copper or lead pipes. So is that what happened in Flint, was that they didn't have the chemicals to inhibit the corrosion of the pipes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you know, they, were, they were getting water from the Detroit water system, and it was expensive, and they said, well, let's do it. We can get it cheaper from the Flint River, and they go. Yeah. Unfortunately. Two more questions. I think you had one. Well, I was going to follow up uh, from a couple of questions a, a moment ago regarding Historically and in a contemporary sense, uh, has the sticky water treatment plant had any experience with an effluent, either you know, a, a it's water highly water soluble, so that uh, created problems that you had not anticipated uh, downstream, and that you had to do some special work to to, to purify the water. Oh. At sticking, well, yeah. any yeah. treatment plant. That's what we talked about. But is there something some place else that has? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, like. Any industrial system, there's been an evolution in, in technology, and there's treatment technologies that are being used now that weren't available a generation ago. Uh, and of course, you know, the reversal of the river in Chicago has had a long, long and very uh, strong impact on the Illinois River, practically destroyed the Illinois River in the early 1900s, and then as treatment was built in Chicago and Joliet and Peoria and other cities along, the Illinois River has slowly come back uh, in terms of quality. So that's the that's the impact that has been eliminated. We, 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 we maybe about a year ago had something that came into our plant, but we don't know where what it was or where it came from, but it was very large, whatever it was, and it affected the microorganism and kind of killed off most of the microorganism. It didn't get to the point where it got into the effluent, but it was, and we could do some manipulations because we knew it had come in, but we never found out what it, where it was. It hit fast, it hit hard, and it was gone. And but we can't control if somebody dumps something. We can't control, oh, your rope discharge, you know, rope exactly. discharge. Yeah. But we could see it in the microorganisms right away, and we were able to reroute things so that it wouldn't affect our. And yeah, these plants are pretty big. Yeah. And it's, it's tough to upset them, but yeah. it can happen. And uh, 1989, the uh, North Side plant at the time, up in Skokie, which is now called the O'Brien plant, it was hit by a, a load of cyanide. Kill all the bugs and kill a lot of fish in the in the river, and uh, even though investigators were sent out immediately to try to find the source, uh, nothing could be determined definitely until somebody who knew something worked in that industry. It was a, it was a plating shop, and uh, uh, told the federal government about it, and they. Caught the perpetrator. Actually, this individual served jail jail time. Mm -hmm. So, one more question. Oh, you talked about uh, heavy metal contaminants. I was wondering if the microorganism population, um, you know, addresses the pharmaceutical contaminants that can get into the wastewater. Mm. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, no, you know, that's something that we just we just. The, the systems are really weren't really designed to handle, but we don't see any impact on our microorganisms because of it. So uh, uh, it, 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 that's something that has to be addressed at the source, at the people who's dumping it or people who's flushing it and that type of thing. But it just goes, it can go right through the system and go right into the riverways. It's just no way that we can remove those. Maybe somebody can genetically engineer some bugs that can remove some of these pharmaceuticals. And eventually, I'll probably, they probably will. So we want to thank you again for all coming and with such great, lively questions. Yes. So thank you very much, okay. and take time to see the I do want to say that there's a part two. In the lobby, uh, thanks to Lindsay, we have a beautiful art exhibit based on the work that you saw here. 
But we have additional materials, and we have Alyssa Chernick here for the Downers Grove Sanitation Department, and she has a display downstairs, including uh, biosolids uh, pamphlet and some other things related to pharmacology. So there's a lot of good materials. Thank you to uh, the Downers Grove Sanitation District. There's the Green Valley uh, district which processes our wastewater we have a pictorial tour there they've offered us a actual tour but i said today was a little chilly yeah. so if you're interested in an actual tour uh stop and see me and i'll take your name for the future and we also have uh, something from the woodridge public works department they dropped off a rain barrel display so there's a lot to see in the lobby and before you leave the room we have dick's book and we have some other materials for you to take home including something from scarce and scarce is a dupage county based organization that really would be interested in clean water and the ways in which we can contribute and they have a handout there Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Lindsay and to Tony and to Dick. Very nice program. Thank you. Thank you.